What are two simple things you can do when you are overwhelmed with it all? That's what we're gonna to explore today on Your Life in Process. If there's one thing that I've noticed, it is that we are overwhelmed. We are overwhelmed by the tragedies that are happening in the world right now. And on top of that big global sense of overwhelm, we're overwhelmed with our own lives, just the busyness of it all. And when I'm overwhelmed, I go and read Pema Chodron. And I'm gonna start by reading a passage that I read this morning from Pema Chodron. And then we're gonna unpack it into two simple things to do when you're overwhelmed. And these two simple things, I'll, I'll, of course, I'll complicate with some research and some practices. But if you really boil it down to just these two simple things, it might be useful to you. And if it's useful to you, it's useful to me. Because one of the best things that we can do when we are overwhelmed is not spread our overwhelm. Okay, so here's a passage from Start Where You Are, A Guide to Compassionate Living by Pema Chodron. Life is glorious, but also wretched. It is both. Appreciating the gloriousness inspires us, encourages us, cheers us up, gives us a bigger perspective, energizes us, we feel connected. But if that's all that's happening, we get arrogant and start to look down on others. And there's a sense of making ourselves a big deal and becoming really serious about it, wanting it to be like that forever. The gloriousness becomes tinged by craving and addiction. On the other hand, wretchedness, life's painful aspect, softens us up considerably. Knowing pain is a very important ingredient for being there for another person. When you're feeling a lot of grief, you can look right into somebody's eyes because you feel you haven't got anything to lose. You're just there. The wretchedness humbles us and softens us. But if we're only wretched, we would just all go down the tubes. We'd be so depressed, discouraged, and hopeless that we wouldn't have enough energy to eat an apple. Gloriousness and wretchedness need each other. One inspires us, the other softens us. They go together. So these are the two practices, softening and savoring. And we're gonna go into each of them. I'm gonna give you tips on how to do both, how to soften in the wretchedness and savor the gloriousness. These practices are really a foundation of being present with it all, with the impermanence of it all, as well as shifting our mind and our focus and our intention to that which we wanna grow, the seeds that we wanna water in our life, the values that we wanna to bring to fruition the engagement that we want to have. So let's begin with softening to the wretchedness. You can think about a problem that you are struggling with, um, something that makes you feel pretty terrible. And what happens when we are overwhelmed by our problems, whether they're our personal problems or more global uh, problems, existential problems, is that we have a tendency to grab a hold of them, tighten up with our body, get rigid in our thinking, and stuck in either a story or in a sort of complex kind of problem-solving mode of figuring something out. And in doing that, we create more stress on ourselves, more stress on our bodies, and more stress on the people around us. So we can soften in three ways. And the first is to soften with, with your body. You can practice softening your eyes right now. You can soften around the edges of your eyes. We know that these um, muscles that are around the edges of our eyes are connected to our ventral vagus system and, and they're part of our social engagement system. In a lot of Thich Nhat Hanh's teachings, he talks about smiling with, with your eyes and and that we, we soften our eyes, we smile with our eyes, it sends messages to our brain, a softening of the mind, an opening of the mind. So you can practice softening with your eyes. You can also soften with your body by softening your breath. Softening your breath. Can you make it smooth, 
and soft and gentle. And that softening of the breath is part of something like soothing rhythm breathing, which we know from compassion-focused therapy is really helpful in steadying the nervous system and telling your body that you are safe in this moment. And then we can also just soften around the edges of tension within our body. So finding within your body something right now that's a little bit grippy, holding on. And can you give it permission to let go a little bit? When we're faced with the wretchedness of it all, softening allows you to be with it without using up all your energy in resisting. So soften with your body. And then we can also soften with, hi, I'm Dr. Diana Hill. Thank you so much for joining me with Your Life in Process. And if you want more, if you're interested in applying these processes to your daily life, join me at my membership, More Life in Process. At More Life in Process, you will get meditations for you to practice at home. You'll get extra bits from the episode that maybe got recorded after the fact. You're going to get PDFs and handouts, things that you can use to apply your daily practice to your life. And I can't wait to see you there. $5 a month, $50 for the year. You can go to yourlifeinprocess.com to sign up. And you can tell a story when you're saying things like, it's always like this, or it will never end, or um, I am, or they are. Those are signs that you're caught in a story. And for a lot of us, especially those of us that are worriers, part of our overwhelm isn't actually what's happening right here and right now. You can handle this right now. What you can't handle is your mind's story about how bad it's going to be in the future. And we have a tendency to predict that we're going to handle things worse than we will and that we will have fewer resources than we have. And when we're worrying about the future, we actually aren't really doing a whole lot in the here and now to plant the seeds for a better future. A client of mine sent me uh, a recording of Alan Watts. And in it, Alan Watts talks about the game of life. And he said, existence is playful like music. When you play the piano, you aren't trying to get somewhere, right? You, you play it. If you're trying to get to the end of the song, why would you play the song? And he says, we need to stop taking ourselves so seriously. We need to step out of the I must survive mentality because none of us are actually going to survive this. When you see your life as something that you're just trying to get through, it becomes a drag. What Alan Watts was recommending in this, in this talk was to see our lives as a game that we're playing. Be in the game as it is right now, rather than wishing things were different than they are or caught up in some story of you're going to try and get somewhere else. So we soften the story. And the way that you soften the story is you notice that you're caught in the story and you come back to the game, the game that you're playing of life right now. So you can soften the story by not taking it so seriously. You can soften the story by engaging with what's right here and right now, noticing your cotton story. And you can soften the story by finding some steadiness with your mind. The equanimity, which is one of the four immeasurables in Buddhism, four immeasurables are the four things you could never have too much of. You can't have too much loving kindness. You can't have too much mudita, which is empathetic joy, seeing the joy in other people. You can't have too much compassion and you can't have too much steadiness, equanimity. So softening your, your thoughts, softening the story is also softening to the, the flow of it all, moving with the flow of change, finding equanimity and change, softening our mind around change that change is inevitable, it's always happening, and can we move with it the way that a leaf moves down a stream or water moves around rocks? So we soften with our thoughts. And then the third way that you can soften to the wretchedness of it all is softening with your behavior. So one of the things that Pema Trojan said was, don't go down the tubes. Don't go down the tubes, folks. 
And you know for yourself how you go down the tubes. For some of us, we go down the tubes in um, sort of behavioral ways that we stop caring for our bodies. Maybe we don't eat enough. Maybe we eat things that aren't great for our mood or cause inflammation. For some of us, we exercise too much or we don't move enough. For some of us, we go down the tubes because we stop taking care of the chop wood, carry water, the little things in our day that we just need to care for that help our future self out, right? We don't do our laundry or we don't do the dishes or we, for me, it's like we I just stop doing my notes and so they pile up more and more and more. And the more that we don't care for the small things, the more the small things become big things when we're overwhelmed. So we can soften our actions because oftentimes what either you may be doing is you're letting things go or you're doing too much. And both of those are not wise effort. Wise effort is doing the things that are high priority that need to get done, doing them in a way that is kind and soft and caring, and also doing them in the way that you are in them. You change your relationship with them as opposed to just getting them done. So one of my favorite strategies around softening with our actions is the strategy of feeding two birds with one seed. Now, this is a nonviolent statement for the other one, which is killing two birds with one stone. We're feeding two birds with one seed. So feeding two birds with one seed, those two birds could be you and you. Those two birds could be you and somebody else, or these two birds could be someone else and someone else, or a planet. But here's an example of feeding two birds with one seed that is softening with your action, bringing softness to your overwhelm. Often my schedule, before my kids come home, I have a little bit of a break, like 15 minutes after work, and there's lots of different things that I do in those 15 minutes. But one of the things that I've discovered is really beneficial when I'm overwhelmed is to feed two birds with one seed by emptying the dishwasher. I go up to my house, usually it's somewhat of a mess from the morning, and I feel overwhelmed by that. And emptying the dishwasher feeds two birds. It feeds the bird of me in the moment. This is something concrete that has a beginning and end to it that I can just focus on putting the spoons away, putting the plates away. I kind of know what to do. It has an accomplishment satisfaction quality to it, a mindfulness practice to it. And then it also feeds the seed of my husband because my husband does the dishes at night. And I know that if I empty the dishwasher in that afternoon time, I'm giving him the gift of an empty dishwasher to put the dishes into. I'm feeding a bird, my husband bird. And I'm also feeding both of us because that means he'll get to bed earlier. And that's always nice when you're not waiting in bed for your husband to come into bed. So feed two birds with one seed. And those two birds could also be two birds for you. Maybe you're doing something that's helpful for you in the here and now that also helps your future self out. Or maybe it's two birds in your life. It could be feeding the seed of our planet in some way, caring for our planet, like literally going and watering some seeds in your garden or feeding the seed of a child, taking care of a child in some way, but giving in some way and practicing that mudita, that sympathetic joy of giving. Okay, so softening. That is your first practice when you're feeling overwhelmed. You can soften with your body, your eyes, your breath, your tension. You can soften your thoughts. Soften the thoughts around the story of the past. Soften the thoughts around the story of the future. Don't take it all so seriously. Don't make it all such a big deal. Enter the game of life. And then soften with your actions. Don't go down the tubes. Do something that feeds you. And maybe feeds two birds with one seed. Pama talks about life being glorious, but life is also wretched. And when life is wretched, we soften. We also want to look for the spaces where life is glorious, even in the wretchedness of it all. And that's where the second skill of savoring comes in. So there's a lot of research actually on savoring from positive psychology. Savoring is described by Bryant and Veroff as attending to, appreciating, enhancing positive experiences in your life. And, and when you savor things, you feel increased gratitude, it builds resilience, it helps you feel more motivated. 
It improves your well-being and have more positive outlook. There's also some research on it benefiting your physical health. So savoring is associated with lower blood pressure and improved immune functioning. And when you're moving towards your values and it doesn't require a whole lot of effort, those are the moments to savor. There's some interesting research on savoring and its link to impermanence. So there was a 2023 study that was published in the journal Emotion. The research went to a, researchers went into a busy urban intersection and they handed out these flyers to people walking by. Over 200 people got one of two flyers. Both of the flyers said, stop and smell the roses. And on one of the flyers, it said, life is unpredictable. And on the other flyer, it said, life is constant. After they got the flyer, about 150 feet down the road, the researchers had a table set up with a bouquet of roses. And then there were people in the bushes <laughs> observing what people did to code what they did. Those people that got the flyer that said, stop and smell the roses and life is unpredictable were two and a half times more likely to stop and smell those literal roses in the street than people that were given the flyer life is constant. So part of triggering our savoring, which is a very useful skill to have, is to remember that life is permanent. When we can remember that life is unpredictable, life is not constant, then it cues us to take advantage of the life that's right here and right now. We need to remind ourselves of that. We need to prime our awareness of life's uncertainty so that we savor the experiences when the opportunity presents itself. Now, I don't want to say that if you're suffering, just, you know, just savor the good is not the message that I'm giving. But rather, if you're suffering, remembering that this suffering is impermanent, it will change, it will shift. And there may be moments, little pockets of sweetness in there amidst all of the wretchedness, little pockets of gloriousness that are presenting themselves to be savored. So how do we savor? What is the process of savoring? There is a paper written by Erika Miyakawa and colleagues. It was actually reported in the Annals of Tourism Research. And this paper came out of the College of Contemporary Psychology in Japan. And this paper was looking at the processes that are involved in savoring, actually talking about how to savor our past uh, travel and our current travel to enhance it. But these processes apply to all forms of savoring and I think can be useful for you when you're feeling overwhelmed to put into practice. They listed five processes that reinforce savoring. So these are things that you can practice for yourself when you're wanting to savor a little bit more of the gloriousness of this unpredictable and impermanent life that we are all in. The first process is Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is really just appreciating the, the chance that you have right now to be in the place that you are, to have the opportunities that you have, the people that are in your life, and the planet. When I get really worried about climate change, I go and I practice Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving to the trees, Thanksgiving to the birds that I hear in the morning, even Thanksgiving to the coyotes that I hear at night. Thanksgiving regulates our gratitude. It's a cognitive process, so it's something that you're bringing your attention to. And the, the type of Thanksgiving to practice with savoring is Thanksgiving in the here and now. The second savoring process is also a cognitive process, and it's the process of basking. Where Thanksgiving regulates gratitude, basking regulates pride. And not the type of pride where you're putting yourself up on a pedestal and making everyone else worse, but a pride that you've accomplished something, that you have completed something. Oftentimes, when we're feeling overwhelmed, we, we miss out on the many accomplishments, the, the dishwasher that we unloaded, the project that we completed. And it's important to take a moment and bask in that. Take in the positive feelings of completion. You made it through your workout. You took a shower. You got up on time this morning and you got yourself dressed, even though you didn't want to. Basking in and savoring the good feeling of completion. 
So Thanksgiving and basking are more kind of cognitive um, practices where, where you're putting your attention, flexible attention. And the next two are more embodied practices. So marveling is a third component of savoring. And marveling is what uh, is associated with the feeling of awe. It helps increase awe. When you are impressed by something, when there's something auditory or visual that really strikes you, or when you are awed by other impressive human activities. And, and this could be anything from watching sports on TV, seeing the awe a hitter hit an amazing home run. It could be the awe of watching an, a figure skater. It could be the awe of a sunset. We found the other day this little exoskeleton of a praying mantis on our patio. The awe of an exoskeleton. How did that happen? How did it take his whole body off in one piece and land it right there? and have it all, it's just amazing. There's so much awe to be seen. And you can practice savoring by marveling in the awe of it. So with marveling, it's a very embodied experience of feeling the awe, feeling amazed, and let yourself be moved by the awe of life. The fourth kind of savoring practice is luxuriating. And luxuriating has a lot to do with regulating physical pleasure. It's enjoying the, the basic physical things, luxuriating and washing your face, luxuriating and washing your hair, luxuriating in a warm cup of coffee. I was just talking with some friends um, this week and we were talking about coffee and how we all sort of have this like, should we give up coffee? And all of us are looking at each other. No, wh why would we give it up? It's so luxurious. Sometimes I luxuriate in watching my clients drink their coffee. It's like, oh, it feels so good. Luxuriating in a nice pair of slippers. It doesn't have to be costly or expensive, but really it's simply enjoying the physical pleasure or relaxing and escaping for a while. You can luxuriate in your favorite TV show. Luxuriating is savoring physical pleasure, luxuriating in physical intimacy. And then finally, a fifth way to savor, which is a new one that in this paper adds to the concept of the processes of savoring, is savoring knowing, savoring knowledge. Knowledge being the wisdom that comes from, from your life experiences. Now, in the paper, they were talking about knowledge that comes from travel. So, you know, Erin Westgate has written about this and, and talked talk to her a bit about this. So when you try novel things, it builds your psychological richness. You have this greater knowledge and curiosity about the world. And the suffering that we experience, the challenges that we experience in life, the wretchedness that we experience in life also builds our knowledge. You think about this in terms of post-traumatic growth. You, know, you have a greater appreciation for life, relationship with others, new possibilities that you see that you hadn't seen before. Maybe you have knowledge about your personal strengths or you have more knowledge about spirituality and the spiritual changes that you undergo. There's knowledge, there's wisdom that you can savor. And savoring the knowledge gain from your life experience from whatever you're going through right now, the knowledge gained from the overwhelm, what does not matter to you, you've gained a lot of knowledge about that when you go through something hard, what does matter to you, you gain a lot of knowledge about that when you lose things that you love, savor that knowledge gain. So savoring is the second skill. We have softening to the wretchedness, savoring the gloriousness, and Savoring is enhanced by recognizing the impermanence of it all and the ways in which you can savor is by thanksgiving, basking, marveling, luxuriating, and knowing, savoring knowledge. These are the practices that um, emerged from the beautiful teachings of Pema Chodron. And if it all feels like too much, then you can just boil it down to the very simple mantra. Soften and savor. Breathing in, I soften. Breathing out, I savor. Breathing in, softening to the present moment. Softening my eyes, my belly, my breath. Breathing out, I savor the present moment savoring what is, what's present.
knowing that everything will change. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Your Life in Process. I hope it's helpful for you in your overwhelm. And I look forward to sharing with you some beautiful people coming up on the podcast. We're going to have Emily Sandoz on talking about interbehaviorism. We're going to have Stephen Batchelor on talking about secular Buddhism. I'm going to talk to Louise Hayes about teenagers and Elizabeth Lati about gentle power. I'm going to talk to Brad Stolberg about mastering change. All of this good to come on your life in process. Stay tuned.